this is um, a Cosmos talk that I'm very glad to share. Uh, it's a Cosmos, Cosmos talk on uh, uh, intersectionality as a challenge and uh, an opportunity for, in particular, uh, the feminist movements and women's uh, uh, activities and act in general and uh, the importance of the concept of uh, intersectionalities is uh, related with the acknowledgement of the multiple sources uh, of inequalities and their interactions but at the same time also the acknowledgement of the challenges uh, that uh, uh, um, the feminist movement but also other movements face uh, when trying to address uh, 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 different sources of power and inequalities, uh, uh, trying, however, to avoid fragmentation in actions, uh, to avoid a sort of a ranking of uh, 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 different types of uh, uh, exploitations uh, and disempowerment. And uh, the challenge that uh, the women's movement and other movements faced in the past when interest uh, and uh, identities have been contrasted rather than uh, linked to each other. So uh, one of uh, the issues on which several of the uh, researchers involved in COSMOS on this topic have addressed is how to frame intersectionalities uh, in terms of coalition buildings, uh, of the development of uh, uh, alliances, uh, and uh, of uh, um, enriching uh, rather than complicating uh, uh, mobilization pattern. Uh, we are very glad and we have been very glad to have been able to uh, host Eleonore Lepinard, who is an associate professor at Lausanne, uh, uh, involved uh, in gender studies with particular attention to quotas, but also uh, uh, developing attention to the issues of uh, uh, intersectionality. And uh, uh, she has been uh, uh, hosted at Cosmos, but unfortunately, uh, almost uh, a few weeks uh, after her arrival, uh, with the uh, COVID uh, uh, emergencies, uh, we had less uh, occasions to meet than uh, we would have liked, but we hope that uh, she will have uh, other occasions to, uh, to come back. Uh, she has uh, uh, written and, uh, and um, uh, soon to be published book uh, by Oxford University Press, Intersectional Politics in Post-Secular Times feminist troubles uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I think that uh, her presentations will also uh, enlighten us on uh, the uh, content of the books. Uh, we will have also as participants uh, uh, to the discussion uh, Anastasia Barone and Giada Bonu, who are both uh, uh, PhD students uh, at the uh, Cosmos uh, Scuola Normale Superiore, uh, where they are studying uh, uh, in different ways in which uh, feminist groups organized. Uh, on uh, uh, different uh, issues, but that all uh, address also um, uh, problems, uh, challenges related with uh, uh, intersectional uh, type of uh, uh, activism and uh, um, intersectional type also of uh, audiences. So um, without uh, taking time to the discussions, I want to thank again Elena for being with us, uh, hoping she will be uh, with us uh, once again uh, uh, when we return to normality. And I give it the floor, please, Elena. Thank you very much. So thank you for the invitation. I do hope to be back in a non-COVID time <laughs> at Cosmos because we didn't really have time to uh, to forge uh, deep relations in six weeks uh, before the pandemic. And I'm also looking forward to uh, this discussion. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a PDF 
and um, and so I hope this is gonna work. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you all see. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So so. The title of this presentation is, um, as Donatella said, the title of my new book that just came out so, some weeks ago. And um, I'm trying in this presentation to kind of present the arc of the argument, which is, of course, impossible in 30 minutes. So I apologize in advance because, like, I'm going to tell you everything that I should have said and not say it, which is not a good <laughs> way to do. But, you know, at least maybe it will give you some kind of a teaser uh, to read the book. It's in open access. So you can actually uh, read it for free at uh, Oxford University Press. Uh, so before I start, I just want because because this is a, a Cosmos talk, and um, and so it's I guess the the audience is more a kind of social movement crowd. Uh, I wanted to uh, situate a little bit uh, the approach that I develop in the book, and um, in, so just briefly to say that I'm I'm a sociologist by training. I'm a social movement scholar initially. However, the book is kind of a hybrid in the sense that I've tried to um, weave together the empirics of uh, what uh, sociology of social movement can offer uh, using quali qualitative methods. And uh, to weave that also with actually a kind of more normative uh, discourse, uh, feminist theory, feminist normative reflections on the nature of feminism as a political project. So my goal was to explore uh, not only the, the social and political dimension of the of the movement and the conflicts uh, that um, have been going on, but also the moral and the ethical dimensions of feminist uh, feminist activism. And those dimensions, I think, are um, often overlooked by social movement scholars uh, when we focus, because we tend to focus on activists' uh, resources or networks, trajectories, social characteristics, memories, histories, etc. And I chose to focus uh, more on um, the moral dimension of activism and its links uh, with em emotions. So there, it's a kind of moral turn, if I may say so, that um, I propose. And I think it fits very well uh, with the study of feminism because there is a lot of feminist normative theorization about what feminism should be, uh, what is proper feminism, what is proper feminist activism and what it should look like. So there was, a, 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 a whole, I mean, a whole bunch of literature to engage with uh, at that level. However, I don't think uh, that this should be limited to feminism, uh, because I think that for students of other social movements, there might be, uh, it might be also a kind of interesting venue to explore, uh, to focus on the moral dimension of activism, activism the moral bonds uh, that activism creates between activists, and how they are articulated with the political project. Uh, that um, these movements uh, pretend to um, build and the kind of political change um, they wish uh, to see happen. So that was my piece of introduction. So the, the title of the book is, of course, an homage. I don't know if you say homage in English, actually, uh, but a reference at least to uh, Judith Butler's famous book, Gender Trouble. And it's not just for the sake of it, actually. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the book, uh, Butler's book, Gender Trouble, you might remember that uh, it opens up with a reflection about the subject of uh, feminism. So the book is uh, 92, uh, 1990. And uh, already Butler describes the question and the, the conflicts uh, that have arisen um, inside a feminist movement linked to uh, the recognition of differences uh, between women and how they have been overlooked uh, by feminist theories, and how an attempt to kind of close the subject of feminism around a specific identity, women, is bound to fail. So Butler asked, as you can see on the, I hope, on the quote, through what ex exclusion has the feminist subject been constructed, and how do these excluded domains uh, return to haunt the integrity and unity of uh, the feminist group? So uh, Butler's argument was very critical, and it's still actually critical today. And uh, she argues that the boundaries of the feminist subject should never be closed, uh, but always critically uh, appraised, critically scrutinized, with this kind of very daunting question, uh, who is excluded from my definition of feminism, uh, my definition of women? So in a very modest way, 
the book project is a kind of a attempt to answer that question uh, for um, contemporary feminist movements today uh, in France and Quebec, the two case study that I look at uh, in the book. So I go back to that question, which has animated uh, feminist theories for several decades now, which is how can we define the feminist subject? What is the subject in the name of which feminist activists, femi feminist activists enounce their claims? And uh, what are its exclu exclusionary effects? So these questions are very um, pressing, actually, in the contemporary context, um, especially in Europe, but not only. Uh, where you are probably aware that for the past 20 years we've had we have witnessed actually also in Italy in many European countries a lot of debates about uh, over the prohibition of uh, Islamic headscarves and those debates have tended to fracture uh, feminist movements feminist organization uh, very much so in France it depends on the context in some contexts uh, such as Quebec alliances have um, have been able to hold and in other contexts, uh, that debate has really like fractured uh, feminist organizations and feminist movements. So, so Sarah Faris has coined the term femonationalism uh, to kind of uh, capture uh, what these debates have done, which is partly to enroll uh, feminist and gender equality values in a xenophobic nationalist project, you know, arguing that we <laughs> embody as westernized uh, white uh, nation uh, gender equality and that immigrant racialized people uh, cultural others uh, especially especially uh, muslims would embody a kind of uh, cultural difference that is um, opposed uh, to uh, gender equality so so in many ways the feminist conflicts uh, about muslim uh, veiling uh, legislation prohibitions have paved the way to um, femonationalism. So that, that is this instrumentalization of women's rights and gender equality. Um, and feminist conceptions of freedom, of gender equality, have underpinned discourses that propose to free, free Muslim women from their own beliefs, their own identities, and their own communities. So that's the context in which the book is set. And the book is, in any way, an attempt to uh, document the rise but also the contestation of femonationalism by feminists uh, themselves in France and in Quebec, and to propose a normatic vision of how feminism and feminists may counter femonationalism um, through a project, a political project that uh, would not be so exclusionary. So I ask, uh, how do we explain that many feminists adhere or criticize femonationalist discourse? What kind of feminist projects uh, do these various feminist discourses sustain? How do feminists themselves grapple with the recurrent crisis and conflicts over uh, racial and religious differences? So these are questions about uh, inequalities and hierarchies within feminist movements. Who has the power to include and to exclude? But these are also, at least I argue in the book, uh, moral questions about who defines, who is worthy of being named and considered as a feminist subject, and even better, a good feminist subject. So to answer these questions, I argue that we must look at how feminists relate to feminism and to other feminists. So I propose to um, focus the inquiry on the moral and the political attachments to this conception of feminism, uh, attachments that feminists have, and which are rooted in uh, hierarchies of power, uh, especially along uh, racial lines. So it's a normative, but it's also an empirical inquiry, uh, because I argue in the book that only by understanding why feminists do what they do, which is sometimes exclude uh, other women from the feminist project, can we begin to explore uh, the ways in which practices and norms can be reimagined to recover a different kind of feminist project. So just to um, give a little, flesh out a little bit, uh, what does it mean to consider feminism, of course, as a political project, which it is, but also as a moral project? So here I draw uh, in particular on um, actually uh, Linda Zerilli's um, book, The Abyss of, of uh, Freedom, and also on a kind of Arendtian um, understanding of uh, politics. So 
I mean, feminism is a political project. It's a project to create a kind of political community that shares ideals and goals. However, it's important to remember that how feminists define the content of those goals, of those values, actually the content of gender equality, not all feminists agree about what is gender equality or what is freedom. Like if you think about uh, debates about sex work, about Islamic veiling, uh, there is a lot uh, going on, which is about like that the content of, for example, freedom of autonomy is not the same uh, for uh, many feminists. So for some uh, religious practice impede autonomy, for others they might foster autonomy. So although I mean feminists all claim that all claim gender equality, what that concept actually covers, what its, its content uh, may differ, and there is no agreement on the content of these values, which is why, uh, following the really, it's it's typically um, a political project. However, what I add to that understanding is that, um, and here I use um, an inherent um, conception of the political community when she says in the human conditions that uh, what we have to hold a political community together are uh, promises and forgiveness, which are two very moral bonds, you know, to promise, to, to, to make a promise to someone and to ask for forgiveness. And she says that those two um, actions uh, are at the basis of political communities. And so I take on uh, that idea, um, but I give it maybe a more moral content than uh, Aaron does, saying that feminism in many ways is a moral promise. So it has a moral appeal. It is um, not only a, uh, a project of political so and social transformation, but it's also the promise to create uh, political relations with others, uh, in particular with other feminists, because following Arendt, of course, the idea of the promise is that you cannot make a promise to yourself, you always make a promise to someone else. And so as feminists, I argue, we promise, we make promises, and first and foremost to other feminists, uh, promises to share a vision, promises to act together and in a common name, which is that of feminism. So the relations uh, that these feminist commitments create are not only political, um, we don't agree often on the political goal of social transformation, on its content, but there are also um, this relation moral, which is about keeping that promise uh, that is made to other feminists. So the book argues that those moral relations are at the heart of the collective feminist project and that they contribute to define who is to participate and how feminists must engage uh, with each other. So understanding feminism in those terms uh, allows to ask a new set of questions. So those questions are also inspired by uh, philosophies of care and so are in many ways very normative questions. But what I argue is that feminist activists that uh, you encounter when you do feminist fieldwork ask themselves this kind of question. In, in not all the time, but quite often. And they have to grapple uh, with uh, this question and this answer and to elaborate also moral answers uh, to this question. So these questions typically are, to whom do feminists feel accountable to? What type of hierarchies distribute responsibilities and power among feminists? How are moral boundaries drawn and sustained among feminist subjects? and how are vulnerability and privilege distributed among feminists with what consequences for feminism as a moral project. So the idea is that if you focus uh, your, your inquiry on feminist relations, relations among feminists, those questions come up as very central to feminist, uh, feminist identity and feminist activism. So question about responsibilities, question about hierarchies of power and um, and the question of the na nature of the bond, uh, bonds that exist between feminists. So those are the questions I try to address um, in the book. Um, and what I will present uh, today briefly in the time I have left, which is not much, um, are mainly three uh, claims I, I make in the book, have, having those questions uh, in mind. So 
the first question I look at in the book is how whiteness shapes moral relations between white feminists and racialized feminists and how it sustains forms of privilege. So looking at how uh, feminism is defined by the bonds that feminists, the moral and political bonds that feminists pretend to create among each other, I look at how whiteness actually creates and reinforces hierarchies uh, between feminists. I also look at how racialized feminists resist and resent feminist whiteness and how they claim their inclusion as feminist subjects. And then uh, at the end of the book, uh, using the empirical material, that is that the discourses elaborated by feminists themselves, I try to elaborate a more normative um, discourse uh, about how we must rethink the feminist project uh, in order to make it, uh, to, to actually debunk those uh, hierarchies that leads to exclusion uh, within feminism. So I'm going to go very briefly on this. So as I said, the book compares a feminist organization in France and in uh, Quebec using qualitative interviews with feminist activists uh, in feminist organizations. So these two uh, cases, I mean, there's been like a lot of uh, debate about um, prohibiting uh, Muslim head coverings in both contexts, uh, except that uh, in France, prohibition was uh, enacted in uh, several laws and uh, several uh, spaces, the school, the public sphere, etc., the street. Uh, whereas in Quebec, there's been a lot of discussion, but there's been a very protracted implementation which hasn't led uh, so far to like a re real uh, prohibition of the of the practice. But what it means is that in both cases, feminists have had to take stand on the issue of uh, Islamic um, veiling. So, however, what has happened is that, and I just want to go briefly here, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, what happened is that in Quebec, there was an ability of most feminist organization uh, and of the main coalition of feminist organization in Quebec to really distanciate itself from feminationalist discourse and saying that um, any type of um, prohibition made in the name of secularism, so in, to prohibit uh, forms of Muslim veiling, would be detrimental to Muslim women and therefore uh, feminists were opposed to the issue. In France, it was different. And uh, as I said, the movement really fractured in 2004 over the ban of uh, uh, Islamic veiling in uh, public schools. And it has led to like really like a very, very divided movement. Um, and here you, what you see on the screen, one of the images is the image of a, of a, of a parallel and counter demonstration. So now on March 8th, for the past at least four years, there's a counter manifestation that um, self-identify as intersectional and against white feminists uh, who uh, demonstrate in another neighborhood in Paris. So, and these are, this is uh, partly the outcome of the debates uh, that have been going on about Islamic veiling um, in France. Okay, so I start with uh, looking at um, what I call uh, feminist whiteness. So the question of privilege um, inside feminist movement has focused uh, historically in um, analysis and theory on the issue of race, because a lot of the, of the um, um, theoretical uh, literature we have on the question of difference in privilege comes from the US context and has been uh, written by uh, black feminists and feminists of color. So, we know that whiteness has been identified by femini black feminists uh, for a very long time, even before the second wave of the feminist movement, as a form of privilege which profoundly shapes uh, the feminist project and perpetrates exclusions of non-white women uh, from feminist movement. Uh, so one of the ways in which uh, whiteness does that is, for example, typically by labeling white women's interests and issues as universal and sidelining and um, black women's issues, presenting them as uh, specific and less universal than uh, white women's issues. And I document how that still is the case. Um, 
in a contemporary feminist movement, the kind of universalization of uh, the position of white women and their centrality uh, within the constitution of political claims uh, in the movement. Um, so that I, I, I do document that in the book, but what I wanted to talk about uh, today is how um, uh, the concept that I've uh, coined in the book, which is uh, the concept of feminist whiteness. And by this, I try to capture um, how white feminists are constituted as political subjects through their relationships to non-white women. So, and how, how they, they appropriate feminism, they make it white, and how they contribute by their discourse to mark other feminist subjects as others. Um, improper uh, most of the time. So I just want to illustrate a little bit that claim. Uh, there's mainly two ways in which uh, this happens. This happens like this otherization of racialized women uh, within feminist organizations happen through um, a first type of discourse which looks at uh, racialized women as objects of care, uh, kind of benevolent and ambivalent feminist care. Uh, so they are the object of feminist attention but as uh, victims in need of help, mostly. So that's one way uh, white feminists actually otherize uh, racialized women. The other way uh, is um, by actually expressing anger at racialized women, especially when uh, racialized feminists claim um, their place and a more central place in uh, the movement. Um, that is when they claim their existence as feminist subjects, uh, then white feminists uh, are uh, tempted to actually express their anger and reject uh, those claims, uh, portraying uh, racialized women as improper feminist subjects. So I don't. I just want to give like a couple of examples of those discourses that I encountered in France mostly, but also um, also in Quebec. So that's an example of what I call benevolent and ambivalent uh, feminist care, where um, this, so that's an officer in an organization for uh, reproductive health in Paris, explaining to me how um, employees in the organization feel um, a lot of tension when uh, young Muslim girls come to ask for a fake certificate of virginity. Uh, so it's a, it's a reproductive health organization that um, militate for um, abortion, etc., and gives like um, health, uh, reproductive health, um, help uh, for women in need. And so, um, as she says, we try to understand why they wear the veil, why they don't, what it means for them. Uh, it's true when a girl comes to the center veil. It's true. It's a real question for us. It questions feminism. Uh, this fact that a woman can accept this ideological domination. So what we see in that quote basically is that uh, there is a kind of scrutiny of inquiry on the part of white women into the motivation of uh, young Muslim women to wear the veil. So they put themselves in a position to actually um, judge what the practice may mean. And they acknowledge that it brings attention uh, into their day-to-day uh, -day practice at the at the um, at the center. Um, another um, another example in a, in a domestic violence shelter in Paris. So you can imagine women coming here because uh, they experience uh, domestic violence at home. And um, here, what we see is the officer that um, make, takes the decision to uh, welcome women or to um, give them on the street, actually. And uh, she recounts an encounter with the veiled women coming um, at the shelter. And uh, so she asks her. So there is this kind of inquiry, inquiring uh, look into her practice, you know, why she is wearing the veil. So white women always put themselves in the position to actually inquiring about the meaning of the practice. And she also judged that, you know, she was 12 at the time when she decided, and that's too young. Uh, so she, she then said that, you know, that woman actually has uh, uh, gone to university, so she's an educated person, uh, so she should know actually what she's doing. But however, uh, she 
um, concludes by saying that the veil is a sign of women's oppression, which is why she asked uh, the woman to take down her veil if she wanted to be accepted in the shelter. So here we see how that kind of critical uh, inquiry into Muslim women's um, uh, motivation and uh, reasons to wearing the veil is very ambivalent since it's uh, it presents itself under the guise of care, uh, caring for their situation, caring for their potential oppression, but actually uh, act as a, um, a form of exclusion since she cannot join the shelter if she keeps uh, her veil on. Okay, and I have another great, great quote or terrible quote, I don't know, uh, but I will um, I will go on. So the other um, discourse that is typical of feminist whiteness, I argue in the book, is this kind of anger um, from an older generation of white feminists, but it's not only old feminists. So, I mean, it's been again, like very present uh, last year, uh, around Mar March 8th uh, in France with a lot of prominent feminist publishing an op-ed in a French newspaper claiming that, you know, uh, feminism has lost it itself if, if it accepts uh, racialization and that it should be universal, et cetera, et cetera. And so here you just have a quote of a very, very emotional uh, moment in the interview uh, when this um, feminist who's a prominent activist for women's rights in her 60s, uh, accuses racialized feminists to hold wrong ideas about us, us being um, what she thinks is the center of feminist activism in France, it's her organization, and putting herself in the position to uh, be the teacher of uh, racialized feminists, uh, to teach her what they did uh, for uh, racialized women uh, in the past in order to set the record straight. So, what we see here is that. The criticism that a racialized feminist express about the um, exclusionary uh, practices within the feminist movement um, trigger a lot of anger, also melancholy about like uh, um, the past, feminist past that supposedly was more unitary, and a lot of resistance from uh, white feminists to this criticism. So on the other hand, um, in my field work, I, I um, I interviewed a white feminist and non-white feminist, and so I also look at how uh, racialized feminists resist um, feminist whiteness. And so I don't have time to uh, develop, I do more in the book. I just want to stress that there is a variety of ways in which race and religion are politicized by non-white feminists. And it varies between France and Quebec. It, varies from organization to organization and from generation to generation. So it's important to keep in mind that there is great variation uh, also um, among uh, non-white feminists. But I just want to underline here two uh, type of discourse uh, that I encountered. So one is weariness, tiredness and resentment, uh, which I analyze as a form of moral address to white feminists. And um, another wise is uh, a discourse that is allowed by self-organization, which is a discourse of uh, resistance. So, for tiredness, so here it's, um, it's an activist, a Muslim feminist activist, self-identified Muslim feminist activist from Montreal, and she basically recalls the past year of, activis of activism, um, her participation into mainstream white organization, and the violence uh, that um, the the, uh, the organization uh, has imposed on her, especially what she describes is um, being asked to wait. So basically, white feminist organization saying you have a point. Uh, we do understand that uh, we should be more inclusive, that we have to be intersectional, that we have to change our practice. However, um, as you see at the end of the quote, women in our centers are not ready for this, so grassroots organization. Um, and so you will have to wait a little bit more before we implement it, uh, which uh, Soraya, the interviewee, analyzes as uh, not wanting to leave some space for others. 
Um, in France, I heard the same type of discourse, uh, also underlining how um, black women, African women, uh, are excluded from everything that entails recognition from institution, which always go to uh, white women. And um, she ends up a quote, like she describes how her uh, own grassroots organization has never been recognized while it actually does all uh, the work on the ground. And that uh, medals and recognition from institutional always go to white women. And she ends up saying, um, the person who talks gets excluded. So here it's, um, it's interesting. Um, well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll develop that later. So, so that's the kind of weariness, tiredness um, that I encountered and uh, as it was expressed uh, by non-white feminists. However, um, there is more than just uh, resentment or uh, weariness. There is also active resistance to transform the moral bonds and the political relation between a white and non-white feminist. And here you have a South Asian activist from Montreal recalling her um, meetings with a um, mainstream white feminist organization in Quebec and uh, telling, telling me and telling them the message she was trying to convey and how she was trying to change relations with them, saying you have to accept that we are here and you have to love us, otherwise it's not going to work. You cannot just tolerate us. And so I found that quote um, particularly powerful as uh, this idea of a politic of love and not just you know, solidarity of, of tolerance but that what she's asking is that, that those bonds be totally reconfigured to the point where actually it could be a kind of loving embrace uh, between uh, white and uh, non-white feminists. And um, here, um, Soraya, the activist I already quoted, recalls a panel she organized on uh, Muslim feminism and how uh, white women, white feminists in the audience started asking questions about women's, uh, Muslim women's oppression. And how, because she organized the panel and because she was sitting on it, she was for once the one who could set the rules of the game and how she could stop this kind of orientalist uh, discourse uh, by just recusing uh, the possibility uh, to ask this type, this type of question and opposing this kind of Cheherazad uh, histories of uh, Muslim women oppression. So here you see like an active, uh, possibility of resistance, which is predicated upon the fact that uh, that day Soraya is actually the one uh, in the position of power because she organized uh, the event and she, as a chair, she can decide who gets to talk and who does not, which is usually not uh, the case. So as I said, I'm not going to have time to um, present the last point. Uh, in the book, I use those uh, discourses and their moral um, undertones, their moral content, uh, to delineate uh, those, what I said in the beginning, which is like those promises and forgiveness as these two type of uh, uh, moral bonds uh, that um, define the feminist uh, community. And so I'll just give you two quotes uh, about um, promise and forgiveness <laughs> to illustrate uh, this idea. Um, so here, um, Soraya recalls how the main organization, feminist organization in Quebec uh, adopted the position, as I said, which uh, opposed the idea of banning, doing a legislation to ban veiling. And she says, we were so happy, we were filled with joy and talking with another Muslim woman at the event, she, she told her today, um, today I feel like I could really belong to this society. So Haya remembers uh, shivering and still shivering when she uh, mentioned it to me. So here we see like the very potent emotional charge, you know, on the vocabulary of joy, uh, shivering, etc. Uh, that uh, this promise of inclusion holds for her as a Muslim feminist to see that that community is going finally to welcome her on her own terms without asking her uh, to be this or that, to not have the veil or to uh, not be this way or the other way. 
Um, interestingly, she also remembers um, having to ask forgiveness herself towards uh, trans activists because there was there is an emotion uh, in the organization voting on um, either a, a, a list of identities naming trans persons, intersex, uh, gay and lesbians, etc., or uh, using a more uh, kind of umbrella term uh, to designate everybody at the same time. And uh, her organization, our Muslim feminist organization, um, did not understand that trans activists wanted to be named as trans person in the charter of the, of the coalition. And so she said it was a tragic moment because she understood that they did something wrong. They excluded, they skipped the list of uh, sexual minority. Uh, however, she did ask for forgiveness. She apologized, although she thinks that these women will not come back into uh, the coalition. So here also we see how important the idea that a promise has been broken and forgiveness must be asked uh, about that uh, breach um, of trust and of that moral bond uh, is really at the heart of how uh, Soraya describes um, her feminist activism and how she envisioned the feminist project. So I'm going to stop here because I've been talking for a long time. And um, I have, um, and when Donatella introduced the talk, so she mentioned indeed um, intersectional conflicts and how we should try to analyze them. So I think uh, what I do in the book, uh, part of what I do in terms of like analysis of social movements is also type, I mean, describing um, how the discourse of secularism and uh, the defense of secularism has provided a kind of new racial politics, a politics of exclusion within the feminist project and new type of resistance uh, toward intersectionality. However, there is, I mean, those dominant discourses in many contexts are less and less dominant. And uh, the recent mobilization, and I think also the politicization of, of race uh, in the French context with um, the, the recent demonstrations show that there is maybe, we're maybe at a turning point uh, where um, a lot of mainstream feminist organizations may have the opportunity to, uh, let's say, um, do an aggiornamento. <laughs> But so, yes, yeah, so I think the book describes uh, how that um, the, ten past, the past 10 years have seen those shifts and how intersectionality has uh, become a new tool for racialized feminists to try to um, make advances inside the movement to have their claims uh, recognized. And I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Eleanor, for your uh, presentation. And thanks to all those who organized this event, which has been really a collective uh, process. I'm very glad to have the occasion to discuss the bo this book and uh, to have had the occasion to read it and discuss it with uh, Jada. And uh, we were both uh, very happy. And we also already met uh, Eleanor uh, during the conference we organized at our department about the feminist strike. So this is also a second moment uh, to meet and to know each other. So I wanted to say that I really, I think that your uh, book is really um, relevant for us, both as uh, scholars and as uh, feminist activists. And I think that what you mentioned uh, in your uh, short introduction about the book is uh, one of the main uh, points for me, the fact that you tried to, and you succeeded in it, to bridge together your empirical analysis and this normative effort in your uh, theoretical uh, section, which shows to me that you really have the intention to contribute to a political debate that is unfolding also within uh, the movement. And I think this is uh, useful, really, for us. A second major point and something I really appreciated is the way in which you situate yourself and your work uh, within the debate about feminationalism, because this debate, uh, which has been, uh, let's say, which has opened up new ways of reflections and uh, analysis, both within the movement and uh, within academia, has very often, also in the case of Sarah Paris, who coined the term, focused on very prominent uh, public figures of uh, feminism and also highly mediatized and uh, 
with a clear voice in the public debate, showing how they have contributed to the development of feminine nationalism. And what you do is something that was still missing because you have uh, uh, a closer gaze that looks uh, uh, at how this phenomenon is, uh, it, how it uh, unfolds or is uh, uh, contested within groups, within organization and uh, within the movement. And I think that this has really allowed you to provide fruitful insights that uh, can shape uh, this debate. And also I really, really liked your um, analysis of emotions. And I will uh, spend a few words about this uh, later because I think this is something uh, really crucial in, the, in this uh, discussion. And of course your book is uh, timing. It's really useful now and in this uh, moment uh, especially. So I think I really encourage everyone to read it because I think it is uh, uh, useful and at the point in this uh, in the phase we are experiencing, not only for feminist uh, movement, but more general for, uh, let's say, anti-racism. So I have a few comments and some uh, questions. My first comment concerned the cases you selected, meaning the organization, not the state. So, um, it, it is clear that uh, interviewing uh, activists from this organization, you managed to have a very uh, deep, uh, uh, very deep insights from uh, them. But what was uh, somehow missing, at least according to me, reading your book, is more the the day by day activity they perform in their uh, in their groups and in their organization. And somehow it would be um, it, it would be interesting to know more about how the different activities they do also shape different attitudes and uh, approaches. Uh, and even I mean you you say that there are differences in how activists conceptualize or, or politicize race if they uh, provide services on the one end or if they are organizing consciousness rising groups. But even in the case of those who provide services, and we were talking about this also with Jada, um, it would be interesting to, to see if and how the different services you provide also shape different uh, kind of attitudes and different kind of reflection. So if you work in, an in a shelter, as you were mentioning before, or in a healthcare center or in a cultural association, and also the level of institutionalization. Many of the uh, groups you talk about are um, funded by the state, while others uh, don't. And this also might uh, might produce uh, differences and uh, and shape somehow the um, their behavior. So this was my first uh, comment. The second is more, uh, let's say, normative and uh, theoretical, and uh, concerns uh, equality because you clearly share the critique that has been made uh, by feminists on uh, equality as a liberal concept and sometimes, uh, let's say, a fictive uh, equality that uh, simply hide but reproduce inequalities. And feminists, and especially racialized feminists, have highly criticized the idea of uh, equality. But at the end of your book, this seems to remain uh, the, the ultimate aim uh, of what a political community should be. So you say feminism is uh, uh, a political project of a political community in which everyone treats the others as equals. That is not the same of saying uh, a political community of equals, but still I see the risk of uh, reproducing uh, the race blindness and that, that you criticize uh, in your book. And this is the first risk. And the second risk is uh, to, to trace again the boundaries of the definition of what feminism is. So I, I struggle a lot in uh, defining feminism in uh, one sentence. And I think it's really hard. And sometimes, I mean, it's so hard that I think that probably is not the point to define what feminism is. And I also believe that this is the reason why we started talking about feminisms in uh, the plural form, 
because it might happen that uh, in, uh, in my feminist group uh, we decide to, to to practice a feminism that we share and it might be very different from the feminism of another group and so maybe we don't really need to to, to close this definition to decide what feminism is or at least not one single feminism because then you you risk also to um, think that the subaltern subjects within this community will simply enlarge the boundaries of something that is more or less already there while sometimes they completely uh, redraw this uh, the project and then my last point is about emotions. Uh, I really, really appreciated the part in which you talk about resentment and how it can also be not only a way to state identity, but also to claim uh, recognition from uh, the part of other feminists. And um, I wanted to, I mean, I, I really think that this is a point and I would go even farther in this analysis. And this is also kind of a question, but how much productive can conflicts be rather than fake coalitions? There are cases in which resentment is really simply resentment. You really want to show that you are in conflict. And it's not always a, a way to build a further dialogues because sometimes you are the oppressed and the other are the, the those who are uh, oppressing you. So, and then just a few short uh, questions. One is connected to this and uh, is about separatism because you talk about self-organization and you mentioned separatism as one of the possible effects of the different uh, kind of relations in an intersectional uh, way. But separatism, uh, connecting this to what I was saying before, sometimes is the political and strategic choice that is not opposite the, is not the contrary of coalition. Sometimes it can help subaltern subject to uh, get power in order to get uh, in contact with the others. This is the third thing. The second concerns uh, um, the current feminist uh, movement, Ni Una Menos. Um, and I don't know if you did your fieldwork before the, let's say, the rise of uh, Ni Una Menos, but this I mean, and maybe you didn't find any trace about it, and this would be very interesting for us to know <laughs> if there are no traces in France and in Quebec. But this is interesting to me because Niuna Menos has a strong uh, intersectional discourse, and I think it's not by chance that it's a movement that comes from the global south and then first developed in uh, Latin America, and it has strongly influenced the European feminism, and we are experiencing this in Italy a lot because compared to other uh, phases of uh, feminist uh, mobilization, I, I'm not saying that there are no problems at all, absolutely not, but yes, okay, but the discourse, at least the discourse is uh, really highly intersectional. And the uh, last point about intersectionality as a concept, this is the problem we all uh, experience. There is this strong debate about the way in which academia is whitening intersectionality and detaching it from its history, its origin and the struggles it comes from. Uh, none of us has a solution for this. I just wanted to ask you, how do you situate yourself in this uh, debate and what you think about it? Thank you a lot. Thank you. So I have... <laughs> I have like 45 more minutes. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and uh, we have to wait also. I suggest that we wait for Jada's comment as well mm -hmm. before I give you the floor back. Yes, yes. So, okay. Jada, please. Hi, everyone. And I will try to be very short so <laughs> we don't add so much. Um, so, first, of course, uh, thank you both for the book and for the discussion. I think, the, as Anastasia already said, uh, the book is very timely uh, for many different reasons, but mainly because we are always dealing with this issue of um, how to um, deal with different types of feminisms and also with power. So, how we are um, um, 
using power, how we deal with, with power while dealing with other feminists and so on. And also, for instance, in Italy, this was the case uh, a few weeks ago, uh, there was this girl, Silvia Romano, which was uh, released after one year and a half that she was kidnapped uh, and she came back with a veil. Uh, and this was really a huge discussion in Italy, but not only for feminists, but in general, in the public debate, because she was wearing the veil. And of course, also because she was a woman. And this is uh, completely different from uh, the other uh, people that were kidnapped and, the, and then released. So uh, it's very timely. And also, uh, while reading with your, uh, your book, I, was, um, I really remind uh, about uh, a debate in Italy uh, around a practice that is called uh, affidamento, uh, which was uh, a practice uh, that the library of the Women's Library of Milan um, talked about during the 80s. Uh, and it was really opening uh, a huge conflict within the Italian feminism uh, because I think they were doing something similar. You described about white feminists in France. So uh, pushing for uh, a sort of uh, um, reliance of some women on other women uh, that have more power, more knowledge and so on. So I think there are a lot of uh, uh, similar things happening in very different contexts. And then I have some comments and uh, and. A uh, question that I would like to talk with you about. Uh, the first one, uh, it's about the context. Uh, uh, reading your book, I was really, uh, I, I felt that something was missing, uh, uh, the context. So something more about the, for instance, the economic situation, uh, the, the type of neoliberal setting uh, in which this, uh, this story is happening. Uh, but also on the other side, <clears throat> what Anastasia mentioned, uh, so uh, what is going on uh, in terms of feminist global movements? Because in the last few years, we really experienced a new emergence of the feminist movement. Uh, and this also reminds me about something that Sarah Faris mentioned in her book on female nationalism. That is that every time there is a cultural debate on, on something, uh, it always hides uh, an economic side that is not mentioned. And in this case, uh, it really reminds me about it because often uh, racialized women or feminists uh, that are in this debate are also doing domestic work for white feminists in their own house, private house. Uh, and then uh, the second point about cases. Um, I, I was wondering if... Uh, uh, there is uh, the risk of a sort of binary analysis because you present uh, white feminists and on the other side, racialized feminists. But of course, these are very different uh, fields. Uh, and especially regarding uh, racialized feminists, I was really uh, thinking a lot about it uh, because I think that when we are talking, I, I'm, I think we have to avoid the risk of reproducing a sort of uh, uh, Western bias, uh, because um, there are very different type of uh, feminist approach in the field of racialized uh, feminisms. Uh, sometimes they're not even calling themselves feminists, but they have different type of approaches to women's struggles. And also in terms of veil and uh, tradition in, uh, um, in, in knowledge production and in practices around the Islamic veil, because, uh, I mean, we are talking of very different groups and very different people. Not all of them are migrants. Uh, not all of them are um, uh, recognizing themselves as feminists and so on. So I, I think something more on this was a little bit missing. Uh, and um, and then uh, the third point, I think quite related to it, um, you propose in your book to uh, a, a sort of shift from relationship uh, among women or between women uh, to relationship uh, among feminists. But if we are talking also about services, and I think you're talking a lot about feminist services, of course, 
there is a relationship between a feminist and another woman, a woman, and uh, they are not always uh, feminists. Uh, and and I think we need to acknowledge that not all of them are women. I think you remember maybe uh, Luce Siesta, <laughs> the women's shelter, talking about this issue, uh, because I mean we need tools for. Uh, producing a sort of relationship in which everyone can be herself, uh, also with very different background in politics uh, and in uh, their own life, but uh, finding a place with each other without, uh, I mean, dismissing our own experience. Uh, and then a uh, few points, uh, one about uh, positionality. Uh, you meant, um, and I, it's also linked to what Anastasia said about uh, the intersectionality debate in academia. Um, I think that when we are talking, and all of us, we are white uh, scholars, uh, every time we are uh, using intersectionality as a concept, I think we should be very um, careful, uh, and also we need to uh, very carefully express our how we situate ourselves both in the literature and in the field. Because I was really wondering how was for you uh, carrying out interviews with racialized women as a white woman, but also with white women. Um, of course, it changed a lot, uh, the type of uh, uh, reply they give you. Uh, and in general, uh, I think that, uh, of course, when we, uh, when we come from uh, a specific type of background, both in politics and uh, in academia, uh, we have our own idea and, and scheme and frames about the topic. And of course, we reproduce this idea, even though we are trying to deconstruct it. So maybe something more on positionality would have been uh, good, at least uh, to me. This is some just uh, um, some, some suggestions. And then I was also wondering, uh, what about using a negative case? So uh, you talk about uh, countries and contexts in which the debate on the uh, Islamic veil was super harsh uh, among feminists, but also more generally in the public debate. Uh, what about other countries? Again, uh, thinking about Italy, for instance, even though we have a super strong history in colonialism and uh, racism, also by now, uh, we, we didn't experience such a debate on the issue of the veil. So it would have, have been interesting also to see why in some context uh, we experience this type of uh, debate and in, in other contexts uh, we don't. So uh, I was just uh, wondering about it. And, and then uh, some final questions, uh, super um, uh, quick also because uh, of course we are both scholars and PhD students and activists, so it's always um, hard to find a balance. Uh, the first one is, um, which type of audience are you talking to with this book? So which type of audience are you addressing? Uh, what do you want to, uh, to say and to whom uh, while you write this book? Uh, and also in terms of literature, what do you think are you adding, for instance, to the uh, debate on female nationalism uh, that is super huge uh, by now? And then um, I think I finished. I can stop here. But really, thank you for, for your work and for this presentation. Thank you very much to Eleanor and thank you for Anastasia and Jada who are uh, um putting a lot of questions on at the table i think it would be fair to give eleanor a chance to respond but also in view of the time uh, i wanted to ask uh, uh, eleanor to take the floor but, and in the meanwhile uh, uh, those who want to intervene um to signal it on the chat uh, and please, uh, uh, Eleanor, try to be short this round. I'll give you the floor back in, uh, afterward. 
Thank you very much. So, uh, well, great, great set of uh, questions. Thank you so much for your careful uh, reading and engagement with the book. So, obviously, I'm not going to answer all. I'm going to point to, I think, some answers are also in the book. Um, so, I'm starting with um, Anastasia. So, about the, the the type of activities the organization engages in, I think that's a great question. I mean, you would actually need to do an ethnography of the 50 organizations I looked at, right? And so, I mean, I, I do have some ideas about that. I think that um, a feminist, and, and I've talked about it in an article I published uh, uh, quite some years ago. I think some, I think white feminists who are in service oriented organization are confronted, um, uh, okay, so more practically, more empirically with um, women who are not like them. And they develop, I think, uh, actually a normative and a moral reasoning which is more uh, subtle and nuanced than white feminists who work in advocacy-oriented organization. I think that tends to then like they universalize, like they see stuff from really, really above. And so I've noticed that difference, right? But then there's also, you know, organizational culture and you mentioned uh, Lucha y Siesta. And I, I mean that when I, I, I came to that uh, great event, I was reminded of also organizations in Quebec, for example, there's organizations in Quebec grassroots that have as a mission to transform the women they help into feminists. So of course, I mean, if you're in this type of organization, you're gonna, you're gonna set up practices and discourses about what is feminism. And if you, have to, if you have to transition towards like a more intersectional feminism, it's gonna raise new questions about how inclusive you are, how people feel comfortable, et cetera. So you're gonna lead to, different reflection than you know, an advocacy-oriented organization. So I think these are very important differences in that we need just more research <laughs> on the topic so that we kind of tease out um, what it means for uh, women in those organizations, uh, what, what, what it means to self-identify as feminist or as uh, intersectional feminism. And of course, like the level of institutionalization and where funding comes from matters. And so a big, a big difference between France and Quebec is that in France, um, racialized feminists have been um, uh, prevented from self-organizing. They have had to self-organize, saying that it's a sub, it's it's a kind of a, a project organization in organization from un under uh, deprived neighborhood. They cannot, they could not organize if they want funding. They cannot organize. They want funding for, you know, like shelters, whatever. They cannot organize on the basis on the basis of race or ethnic identity or religious identity. They will not get funding. So all those groups that have emerged that uh, self-identify as intersectional, Afro-feminist in France in the past five years, um, don't get funding. Are self-funded. So so they are consciousness raising. They do activism, but it's very hard for them to do a service uh, because they don't have the funds. Uh, so that's a huge difference between France and Quebec, and it makes the balance of power between white feminists and non-white feminists very different. Uh, in Quebec, they are self-organized, they get money, uh, because it, it is legitimate uh, to self-organize on the basis of ethnicity. And so if coalition doesn't work with uh, white women, well, then it doesn't work, whatever. It will not prevent them from continue their work, continue their work. So of course, it's a totally different uh, setting uh, in both contexts. So institutionalization, funding are very important and and, and uh, linking that to the question of uh, the economic situation, the funding matters and where it comes from matters because it comes uh, attached with springs, right? And um, what has happened, and I'm sure in Italy as well, is that uh, new public management has meant that feminism, if they want money, needs to work by project and they don't have money for staff, they don't have money for this kind of stuff. And so it has, it has made um, a feminist uh, service organization uh, more uncertain in terms of like what they can do and uh, what, they can, what they can offer uh, to women having to struggle each year to kind of uh, secure, uh, secure funding. So um, Anastasia, your question about um, equality. So I guess, um, what I, the argument, the normative argument I try to make is that uh, there is this um, moral um, claim 
that feminists should treat each other equally. However, it does not mean that it's equal in the sense that everybody would share the same responsibility to treat the other equally. So as I said, uh, with privilege comes responsibility. So responsibility for um, who has to care about whom is different depending on your position of power and of privilege. So I would say that uh, that kind of uh, idea that uh, there is a claim to treat the other equally, the burden rests more on those who are more equal <laughs> than the others. So I also try to recognize those differences and not to like, uh, you know, uh, put them away. Um, and so, so the fieldwork was done between 2010 and 2015. So it was before New Namenos. Um, and um, interestingly, in France, it has led to a new conflict. So, so you know, so despite the kind of transnational success, etc., uh, when it was picked up in France, uh, the coalition that called itself Nutut. Um, so like a kind of a mirror to New Namenos, uh, was felt exclusionary and not intersectional in its discourse. And so another organization was created, Nuzo C. Uh, so like working, like playing on the same kind of us, we. Uh, so, so yeah, so I think it's, it's uh, there is a transnational element, like a lot of feminist discourse travel and between France and Quebec, there's lots of travel. Uh, but there is also a specific uh, historical configuration of feminist conflicts and movement uh, that you know the movement inherits, and that also structure how those discourses are uh, taken uh, up and used uh, in each context, and it's it's uh, it's very different. So um, I don't want to take too much time. Um, so I agree with you, um, Jada. Of course, I try to show that there's a lot of diversity among non-white feminists and also among white feminists. <laughs> There's a lot of diversity. Uh, however, those conflicts really like um, draw, drew lines, you know. And uh, for example, there is a lot of, I mean, I encountered uh, Muslim uh, women or, or women of Muslim origin who are feminists and who were in favor of the prohibition of the veil. okay? So, so, or at least, I mean, they were not in favor of the law, but like they condemned or they did not identify or they, they reprove of the practice, but they would not support the law. So I think that law was really a line of divide between feminists, even, you know, although like you find lots of different uh, position among racialized feminists, all that I encountered, even those who thought that, you know, like wearing a veil was not a good idea, that it was not particularly Muslim, that it was this or that, would not support the law because they could see that it was, it had, it had problematic effect on Muslim women them, themselves. Uh, but they were very, they were very opposed nonetheless to the practice, right? And so that's a big difference between how white feminists, how majority of white feminists I encountered and racialized feminists. Uh, did their moral judgment, like who did they put at the center of their uh, political analysis? So white feminists put at the center of the political analysis the abstract principle of secularism as a defense of women's freedom, like as this principle that's going to help women emancipate. Racialized feminists put at the center of their political analysis veiled Muslim women, whether, whether or not they agree with them, they are thinking about the consequences that those women with, will face if they cannot get education. So that's a very different, um, I mean, that's where I draw the line between those two groups, uh, recognizing the diversity within those two groups. Uh, and uh, I'll end up with uh, maybe um, positionality. So in the appendix, I talk about positionality and, and, and the methodology. And um, so I guess the way I uh, address the issue of the of the risk of whitening intersectionality is that I mostly talk about whiteness. <laughs> I, I I mean I talk about intersectionality, but actually I think the conceptual um, um, framework of the book rests much much more on the idea of wh whiteness than on intersectionality. So I try to really address uh, whiteness uh, more frontally, I guess, and so that's my way. Uh, to to address uh, to address this issue, um, 
And yeah, and what's what the audience for the book? You tell me. <laughs> You tell me. Uh, myself, you know, first and foremost, I think I write the book to make sense of those debates as a feminist, as a white feminist, to make sense of what's my responsibility in this moment. And I think that book is actually uh, the product of that uh, moral uh, issue for me, first and foremost. But if other people read it, great. <laughs> that would be nice. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any, anyone uh, that uh, is. Uh, oh, now I see Rossella. Rossella, please take the floor. Huh. I was writing it, so. <laughs> No, uh, I really, like, you know, uh, enjoyed this talk and it actually made me reflect on many things. But there was one that one, two questions that I wanted to ask you. One is I'm not totally clear about the relationship between moral disposition and emotions. And I'm also thinking about the role of I think there should be more emphasis on the role of like negative emotions, like discomfort, you know, or like, you know, taking a step back, sh shutting up, you know, silence. So if you could say something about that. And then the other thing I was thinking, thinking about variation across country, like I was in Spain in March, and, and the issue that was dividing the movement was actually the trans issue, no? And that's another, I think it works very much like uh, the veil and rationalization. Uh, this, uh, the, the feminist movement is really divided on, on this, and this is used also, I think, in femo-nationalist discourses, even though femo-nationalist is not uh being coined in that sense so like if you see differences or parallel like with this issue like you know and how movement uh i will say strategize around this issue and divide them the, the feminist movement divide around this issue yes i would like to add a question to rostella and uh, which is also in part related with different contexts, but also different historical moments. Uh, and in particular, intersectionality in your research, which I found fascinating, is related with race, but not with class, which mm. was instead uh, a most important issues uh, in uh, the feminist movements uh, uh, in the 70s, for instance, in Italy, but even in France, uh, was also addressed. So not just the questions of uh, um, whiteness, uh, but also a questions of uh, uh, middle classes versus working women and the capacity of the movement to extend also uh, there. And uh, more in general, of course, uh, you cannot do everything in one book, but I was uh, wondering also a bit related with questions that uh, Anastasia and uh, uh, Jada uh, have uh, uh, addressed, uh, which is uh, uh, how much then uh, these uh, attitudes and uh, normative concerns that you have about the relationship between women uh, are also relevant when uh, you look at relationship with other movements. Uh, and uh, so not only um, feminist towards feminist or uh, feminist towards women, but also feminism towards uh, 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 other movements, including movements on race, because there the impression is uh, uh, that uh, some instances of the anti-racist movements uh, are um, um, more inclusive than uh, some of uh, uh, the feminist uh, groups. And since uh, one element that emerged as very important in this uh, 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 recent wave of uh, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter is the capacity to go beyond uh, the sort of uh, most direct core reference point. I wonder also how this is uh, addressed in uh, uh, in uh, studies on feminism. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me see if there are other. No, it's only Rosella. So I give you the floor for the final uh, 
uh, 10 minutes more or less. Thank you. Yeah, I did the reverse of what I was supposed to do. No, I was saying, okay, challenging question again. <laughs> I hope I have uh, some kind of answer, I'm not sure. So, but the rule of emotion and the link uh, with moral disposition. So I guess in many ways, emotions are more like a cue um, to identify moral disposition. So like the, the, the um, not the appearance, but like the embodiment of emotion or the emergence of emotion during interviews or the discourse about emotions, for me was um, the mark of uh, the moral bond of that has been breached or that is on the contrary working and you know provides joy. So, so it's really um, this kind of symptom of morality in many ways, emotions. Or at least that's how I see it. Also, it's both kind of a sign and a product of the moral re relations. Um, that's how I treat it, I think, in the in the book. And so, of course, negative emotions are important. But uh, there's there's and I mean, there's been uh, you know like um, there's been a lot of criticism by uh, black feminists about also some negative emotions of uh, white feminists that block uh, the work, like guilt. So guilt is. Uh, a negative emotion but it's really negative in the sense that actually it does not help transform relationship or like move forward or recognize uh, responsibility so i think in, when it comes to negative emotion i think some are uh, uh okay so some are positive so some negative emotions are positive or some negative emotion may my, my question would be do this emotion um contribute to transform relationships to these debunk hierarchies, you know? So if there is uncomfort because you are silent for once, then that's good, right? Because it means that the balance of power is shifting. But uh, if you um, feel negative emotion, but that takes you an opportunity to take the floor, to express how negative emotion you're experiencing, and then once again, uh, not being silenced, but on the contrary, like expressing your guilt, then it's not very it's not very helpful or it's not changing anything. So I think in in when it comes to negative emotion, there is also a range uh, that we have to explore on uh, how um, and and interestingly, like I'm I'm writing this piece with a colleague about how uh, white feminists, among others, but like react to intersectionality and what kind of emotions it triggers. And so you know, negative emotion can also be resistance. Uh, toward acknowledging responsibility, for example. But there can also sometimes uh, be uh, the mark of that acknowledgement. So it, it depends. And about context, of course, um, yeah, I think, the, I think a lot of what uh, the book describes about race uh, could be transposed or uh, for, um, for uh, debates about uh, trans inclusivity and could also be transposed about, uh, on debates about sex works. Uh, depending on the depending on the context so in france it's great we have the three debates <laughs> going on <laughs> we have the three conflicts but um and then i was in an interview with an uh, an older white feminist and uh, she was she was saying you know we are uh, uh, what is this with the intersectionality this is not what it's supposed to be about like a, a trans a veiled girl and a prostitute come on so like that was like the triad of bad feminist subjects she was trying to uh, uh, push back uh, from, uh, from her project. So certainly um, the issue raised uh, by the Islamic veil about like who is a good subject, who is a bad feminist subject uh, can be uh, analyzed for uh, other contexts. So now going to uh, Donatella's comment. Um, so, so Thinking back about um, the debate um, during the second wave and the issue of class, and that was like a, a, a big, uh, a big debate in particular in France. Not so much in Quebec, actually, not so much in Canada for many reasons. Uh, it's not the same historical trajectory in Canada. And for the second wave in Quebec, nationalism was the issue, not class, uh, contrary to France. And I think there's both. Um, we can do both overlap and parallels. And so overlap because, of course, a lot of the claims uh, made by uh, racialized feminists are, are also claims uh, about uh, class. And I remember, for example, uh, um, 
uh, an interviewee uh, who was Algerian, Franco-Algerian, and uh, she remembers meeting feminists when she's young, in her 20s, in the 80s in France, at the end of the 80s, uh, beginning of the 1990s, and she meets like this kind of very actually um, class struggle uh, type of feminist uh, in France. And um, the meeting ends very late and nobody asks her if she needs a ride back home and she lives in the suburbs, and which means that she's poor because she doesn't live in the center of Paris. And so how she relates that story, it's as much about her uh, racial identity and even more about her class identity. And so there is this overlap uh, in many cases between class and race. But then there's also a parallel um, for example, um, a lot of feminists already uh, during the second wave and then after who were uh, from the more class struggle, I mean, who wanted to have like this kind of uh, uh, this Marxist approach and who thought that class was uh, as important as gender was, um, lamented the fact that they could not reach working class women, as you mentioned. And we find the same type of attitude in a lot of uh, white feminist organizations, lamenting that they cannot reach non-white women, that they don't manage to have them in their organization. And of course, in both cases, what happens is that, uh, and I think uh, Anastasia uh, pointed to that earlier, is that if, if you're not ready to have your definition of your organization and of feminism changed, then you will not include these people who are excluded by the very definition that you have of feminist activism. And so I think there is a kind of parallel here in what happened uh, uh, with the issue of class and the and the issue of race, and um, and so in relation with other movements, that's a good question. I did not look at that. Uh, my guess would be that I think that the the, um, the diffusion of the vocabulary of intersectionality in uh, feminist practice and in social movement practice is um, producing no, new types of alliances, new possibilities to ally, or new knowledge about how and on what basis uh, alliances can be made. So, so I think we're in a very interesting moment, especially for the younger generation of feminists, uh, where this vocabulary is available and is really a tool to uh, discuss the terms of the relation between movements. So that, yeah. Yes. Thank you very, very much, Eleanor. Thank you also very much to Anastasia and to Jada. Uh, and uh, we can, I think, close here uh, with, um, with the commitment to uh, host again Eleanor in uh, non-COVID time uh, and uh, to be able to discuss further these uh, uh, important uh, uh, issues that that. Um, uh, uh, we have already addressed with Cosmos, uh, with the work of Rosella, of Giada, of Anastasia, and of many others, and um, uh, looking forward to continue this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>